Father, tonight we'd like to thank you that your love for us is extreme and wonderful and goes far beyond us and has come to us from way beyond before we were even made. And we'd like to ask that you'd help us tonight to see things here in David's movements before Saul and uh, give us a clear mind about what is actually happening here. And we ask this tonight in Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. Well, we're up to 1 Samuel 20, but before then we're looking at Psalm 12. Um, we're dodging and weaving between psalms uh, that David is writing, or at least are said to be psalms of David. And this one is um, a psalm of David, Psalm 12. Um, and its pattern, its pattern looks roughly like this. Um, it goes one to two, which I have, and then three to five, is horizontal to people, and then uh, seven and on is to the Lord. So this is uh, Psalm 12. That would be its pattern. Would someone like to read it for us? Psalm 12, let's go straight through it. It's not a long psalm, eight verses, but it's helpful. In a big voice, who would like to read? Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases to be, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. They speak falsehood to one another. With flattering lips and with a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that speaks great things, who have said, with our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are our own, who is Lord over us. Because of the devastations of the afflicted, because of the groaning of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he longs. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times. Thou, O Lord, will keep them. Thou wilt preserve him from this generation forever. The wicked strut about on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. Right, so this is a psalm that's uh, quite remarkable. Um, it's really talking to us about, what will we say, about people who speak treacherously and who speak falsehood mm. and who, and David sees a lot of this issue where people's lips, they say, well, they're our own, we can say whatever we like, who's Lord over us, but... He says, well, that's their mistake. They have flattering lips and they speak falsehood and they have a double heart. What have you got for double heart at 2B? Deception. Deception. Is that what you've got for yes. that? Yes. Mm. Yeah, deception. Yes, the picture, the, 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 the picture is a double heart, but it's, a person has got two, two, two ways of thinking in themselves. Uh, so this is a straightforward, the, uh, one to two is a prayer. He's asking help for the godly man ceases to be. So this is very much David's understanding that he is surrounded on every side by people speaking falsely. And then he says, I take it uh, you know, to <coughs> a direction to others. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips because they think that they can say what they like. But actually, when the devastation of the afflicted is clear, God arises and uh, he will set him in safety for which he longs. So this is, a, 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 this is, what would you say, a desire to be safe in the midst of people who are talking things that are really essentially um, wicked and deceptive and you can't trust them. So David's in a place where he can't trust anybody's words. And particularly, of course, in this case, if we, if we locate this right at this point, with Saul's words, because Saul is saying, no, no, and yes, yes, and then trying to pin him to the wall and trying to kill him, and on the one hand, and so that's a real difficulty for us. Uh, his contrast is that the words of the Lord are pure, and they're tried and refined, and Lord, you will keep them. They will preserve him from the generations. So he's got a longer view about the words 
and a contrast here between the words of God and the words of men in this context of falsehood. Uh, so these psalms are really prayers. They're also reflections. And they're stating something which uh, has to do with um, what is David thinking about in his inner self? And these psalms give you an understanding of that. Whereas our writer of 1 Samuel uh, is actually just telling us the history and it's got a historical flow that he wants to bring. Okay, let's look at 1 Samuel 20. Uh, we left it last, uh, last time at 1 Samuel 19 where you may recall that uh, Michal, uh, it's, it's David's uh, wife, had actually put um, one of the teraphim in a bed as if he was sick and then they came to him, <laughs> it's aimed to get him sick or not, mm. and then he flees. And so verse uh, 1 Samuel nineteen eighteen, David fled and escaped and came to Saul at Ramah. Now Ramah is the same place that you remember as Ramathaim Zophim, where Elkanah came from Hannah, way back at chapter 1. And because uh, there, mm. there are five towns uh, called Ramathaim, uh, and that's why they add a little extra one on. Like in this case, Ramathaim Zophim uh, was that one in Elkanah. Uh, but here, Rama is the section. If you, and if you have a map, you can notice that we are right up just north of Jebus, which will become Jerusalem. So Gibeah of Saul, can you see that? And we're now at and Rama, uh, that we're beginning this first movement, uh, what is called number two on this map right up to the far north. Everybody okay? Can you see where we're going? That's helpful. Well then David uh, came, uh, I'm just going back to uh, verse 18. He fled and escaped and came to Samuel at Ramah. Now I presume Samuel's in retirement uh, in the sense that he's uh, resting. He's old now. And um, and he went and stayed, uh, and he and Samuel went and stayed at Naoth. And it was told Saul, saying, David's at Naoth in Ramah. Well, then Saul sent messengers to take David. But when he saw the company of the prophets prophesying with Samuel, standing and presiding over them. So here's, here's this old prophet now, I mean, really seriously old. And he is looking after a school of prophets, which is um, training up people uh, in their listening to the voice of the Lord and how to speak. And when, and when they came, they also prophesied. When it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they also prophesied. So what is happening here is that God is overwhelming the people that uh, Saul is sending. And, um, and this overwhelming is uh, overwhelming with... He's making him a person who speaks his own word, God by his pro prophecy. So, I mean, he's come with no... no <laughs> No good intentions, whatever. Uh, but in actual fact, he's just getting overwhelmed by God's um, astonishing spiritual power. And so what, they do, what he does there is he takes off his clothes and he lies down naked all day long. And they say, and therefore they say, he's Saul among the prophets. That's often a case that people took off their clothes when they, uh, when they were receiving the word of the Lord. It's a common thing. And... Uh, You'll see it again. And with the ecstatic prophets, very much so. So sometimes people did that. Just their outer clothes. Yeah, probably just their outer I wouldn't be necessarily... Although it says here they lay down naked all that day. But nakedness can mean just that we've got down to our underclothing. Mm -hmm. Because that's... yeah. But the whole idea is that they're overcome. And God has turned his wrath, uh, Saul's wrath, into... Uh, a place where he has graciously overcome him. But he's halted him, of course, from doing it. That's a very telling passage. Because here is the anointed of the Lord, Saul, who's actually hunting the, new, um, the newly anointed of the Lord. And he's now in a place where, because he's about to do wrong here, and he's about to kill him, uh, well then God overwhelms him. And he overwhelms him with his word makes him a person who is must serve God yeah. even though he will yeah. serve himself well we go on 
David fled from Naoth in Ramah and came and said to Jonathan, this I take it would be back towards Gibeah. What have I done? What is my iniquity? And what is my sin before your father that he's seeking my life? To see, David is always asking, what is going on? He doesn't understand uh, in any sense why he, he would be hunted by Saul. Now notice, David isn't, I don't think at all, saying here, I'm one of the anointed of the Lord like he is. He's not putting it like that. He's just a young man who's been elevated, married to the king's daughter, has been very successful at war. Um, he's now got a father-in-law who's suddenly um, on the move against him and he's asking, what's, what's going wrong? He, has, he seems to have no idea of the jealousy and disturbance that's in uh, Saul's heart. We, the readers, know that because our writer is telling us that. So you've got to bear that in mind. He said to him, Far from it, you shall not die. Behold, my father does nothing, either great or small, without disclosing it to me. So why should my father hide this thing from me? It's not so. David vowed again, saying, Your father knows well that I have found favour in your sight. And he has said, Do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But surely as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is hardly a step between me and death. So David understands, actually, that his friendship with Jonathan in some way is now a problem to his father, to Saul. And Jonathan said to David, whatever you say, I'll do for you. And so David said to Jonathan, tomorrow is the new moon and I ought to sit down to eat with the king, but let me go that I may hide myself in the field until the third evening. The Jewish people in, at this time are running to a lunar calendar. And the new moon is a time for celebration and every new moon is a, a feast day for three days. And so David is, of course, one of the top three. There'd be Saul and Jonathan and then Abner. And then what we've got now is David and David's place is going to be empty and Saul is actually sitting in the, uh, what would be the place in, in the Middle East the best place to sit in a room is the upper left-hand corner. So Saul would be sitting in a corner where his left hand is actually uh, safe and his right hand is for his weapon. And so a safe place is to be right up in the top left-hand corner and that's the place of honour. Yes, and you'll notice this. David says, I'll hide myself in the field until the third evening, meaning I'm not going in. I'm, I'm not going to get into a room where, we're, where I'm three seats away and this is not a good place to be. I'm not convinced I'm safe. If your father misses me at all, <laughs> then say, David earnestly asked leave of me to run to Bethlehem, the, his city, because it's the yearly sacrifice there for the whole family. If he says, it's good, your servant shall be safe. But if he's very angry, no that he has decided on evil. What do you gain from this, the way this person is speaking? Well, David is showing you something of the sort of mentality of the time. If he misses me and... Then you, then it's you, it's you, yes, it's a test, yes. It's a binary test. Mm. He's actually saying, if this, then mm. that. But if not this, then not that. And he's actually saying to Jonathan, Jonathan, you're saying it's all right. I don't think it's all right. I think, I think he's out to get me. And I, I'm, I'm not content to turn up in a room where, where I'll just get jammed. I've got no one at my back and I'm certainly at the front. Mm. So what he's saying here is, if he misses me, okay, tell him what you say. Therefore deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with you. Ah, so David understands that the initiative for taking of the covenant between the two of them, in Jonathan and himself, is in fact Jonathan. He says, you have drawn me into this covenant. Uh, what does that tell you about this shepherd boy who's got elevated and is now in the court and is third in the row? He's in command of a significant number of men. And the king's son has drawn him into a covenant which is politically turning out to be very mm. tricky. Right? Mm. So he actually puts it that way in this point. 
you have brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with you, but if there's iniquity in me, put me to death yourself, for why then should you bring me to your father? Jonathan says, far be it from you. For if I should indeed learn that evil has been decided by my father to come upon you, then would I not tell you about it? And David said to Jonathan, who will tell me if your father answers you harshly? That is, how will I gain intelligence of what took place? Jonathan said, David, come and let's go out into the field. Meaning, let's go where we can talk. Jonathan said to David, The Lord, the God of Israel, be witness. When I have sounded out my father about his time tomorrow, or the third day, behold, if there's a good feeling toward David, shall I not then send to you and make it known to you? If it please my father to do you harm, may the Lord do so to Jonathan and more also. If I do not notice the oath there, may the Lord do so to Jonathan and more also. If I do not make it known to you and send you away, that you may go in safety, and may the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. And if I'm still alive, will you not show me the loving kindness of the Lord that I may not die? And you shall not cut off your loving kindness from my house forever, not even when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So he's making a covenant. And our text tells us that. Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David. In the Now our writer is speaking in a somewhat historical, more distant sense. And he's saying... Uh, he made a covenant in the house of David. May the Lord require it at the hands of David's enemies. Jonathan made David vow again because of his love for him, because he loved him as he loved his own life. So what's actually taking place here? Jonathan's assuring him, isn't he, that uh, if my father's against you, I'll let you know. And if he's not, I'll let you know. And I won't let it sit. I'll, I'll, I will do that because I've actually I want you to be safe <coughs> so Jonathan is actually seeing him in himself here a person who can bring about the safety of David in the light of the psalm we need to see that that's the case David is at close quarters with a king in a court as a junior person and he's not feeling very like he's safe, safe. <laughs> And, and Jonathan now arranges in case they need to have a way. And most spies do this if they talk about this way, you know, that they sort of they arrange something which is a signal between them which is only known to them, such that if they need it, they can use it, but if not, then not. But here it is. This is the signal. Tomorrow is the new moon, and you'll be missed because your seat will be empty. When you stayed for three days, you should, meaning in Bethlehem, you shall go down quickly and come to the place where you hid yourself on the eventful day, and you shall remain by the stone Ezel. And I will shoot three arrows to the side, as though I shot at a target. And behold, I will send the lad, saying, Go find the arrows. I take it if you're Jonathan, you don't get your own arrows. <laughs> if I specifically say to the lad, he understands that David is in earshot, Behold, the arrows are on this side of you, get them, then come, for there is safety for you and no harm, as the Lord lives. But if I say to the youth, Behold, the arrows are beyond you, go, for the Lord has sent you away. As for the agreement of which you and I have spoken, behold, the Lord is between you and me forever. So his picture then is that David and Jonathan have the Lord between them and that he's understanding this is not just you and I talking this is you and I talking in the presence of the Lord I'm calling the Lord witness that what we talked about this covenant is actually standing so this is a very serious way of actually um, Jonathan and David are talking in ways that are very deeply um, Committed to one another. Committed to one another. <coughs> yeah, that's, that's right, isn't it? And, and, very, and very serious and understanding that they are in deep trouble if, if, if Dad gets onto this. He does, but there it is. So they have a way to actually not meet, but for David to understand how things lie. So Jonathan is really bringing him a piece of, of intelligence and of information which will give David 
because they've obviously had a difference of opinion between them here. He, he thinks his father's not interested in hurting him. David thinks he is. So this is the way they resolve it. So David hid in the field, and when the new moon came, the king sat down to eat food. The Hebrew word is lechem, which is bread, as in Bet Bethlehem is the house of bread, Bethlehem. And, but of course, it, it, he just means food here. The king sat on his seat as usual, the seat by the wall. Then Jonathan rose up and Abner sat down by Saul's side. But David's place was empty. So you've now got in that case Saul in the corner, Abner, Jonathan. David's place is empty. Nevertheless, Saul did not speak anything that day. Didn't say a word. For he thought, it's an accident. He's not clean. Surely he's not clean. That is to say, he's... He's, he's, he's not, not ready to come. He might have handled a dead body. He could have done anything. You appreciate that Jewish people, in this case Hebrew style, they understand that uh, someone may not turn up. It's perfectly appropriate to not turn up if you're not going to defile the rest of the people. <coughs> but on the next day, the second day of the new moon, David's place was empty. So Saul said to Jonathan, his son, why has the son of Jesse not come to the meal, either yesterday or today? That appears to be a casual question. Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Jerusalem, to Bethlehem. For he said, please let me go, since our family has sacrificed in the city and my brother has commanded me to attend. That is, David's speaking about his elder brothers. And if I have found favour in your sight, please let me get away that I may see my brothers. For this reason he has not come to the king's table. Now this, of course, is a subterfuge. Mm -hmm. and a straight lie mm -hmm. on the left. On the right, it's, it's in honour. These are David's words. This, this is the way they've agreed to speak it. Saul's anger burned against Jonathan. He said to him, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman. Now, now this is, <laughs> you have to understand this. The most honoured person in a Middle Eastern, city, a Middle Eastern family is mum, not, the, not dad. And it's really important to understand that if you want to and somehow uh, curse a person or say something really strong to a person, well, then you call him a son of a whatever and uh, you actually curse his mum. And in this way, you've expressed something uh, to uh, the person, which it's the most serious way to speak. And so Saul is actually doing this. And he says... Do I not know that you are choosing the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? That is to say, you're defiling your own mother, your own family, your own... He's really saying me, us, our family. You're choosing our family second to the son of Jesse. Now, why does he say that? Does he say that because he's actually bought the understanding that Jonathan gave permission for David to go, which is inherent in the speech he's made? Or is he saying something that he knows? Well, we read on. For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom will be established. Now that is a political statement. That's a statement out of his own knowledge, as he sees it. He understands that David is now a competitor. Being a competitor, uh, He's now saying to Jonathan, hey, listen, your kingdom's just as... Your kingdom's my kingdom, son. You don't understand that if you, if you side with him, uh, you're going to go against our family here. And this is... So already you see that Saul is thinking in some sort of uh, hereditary kingdom mentality. Uh, he's also understanding that David is choosing against our family uh, for the son of Jesse. And notice he doesn't speak of David as David, but as the son of another man. And he says, your kingdom will never be established. So he appears, appeals to Jonathan's self-interest. We, the readers, of course, know that Jonathan's self-interest has already yielded in covenant to David that he is for him, not for himself. So Jonathan is actually a selfless individual who's understanding that he is there to bring David to the place he should be, as he sees it. And so he actually says this. Therefore now send and bring him to me. He must surely die. Jonathan answered Saul, his father. He said to him, why should he be put to death? What has he done? 
meaning if you have a quarrel with me, speak. But in actual mm -hmm. fact, what, what's your issue with David? And Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him down. So Jonathan knew, which is fairly much an understatement, that his father had decided to put David to death. Now we've already learned that, Je that Saul's already done this with David twice. So, we, so some people read this text to say this is really an overlay of an occasion of David mixed up with Jonathan. But I think we should read it exactly as it stands. I think what's happening here is that you appreciate these men eat with their weapons in hand. One doesn't leave them go. These are serious days. These are warriors. And, uh, and, they, and, and it may be that no one else has a weapon but the king. That might be possible for his own security. But in this case, he has one. Jonathan rose from the table in fierce anger and did not eat food on the second day of the new moon, for he was grieved over David because his father had dishonoured him. Who's the him? Jonathan or David? What would be your guess? David. David. I think so. Mm. Like you could hardly imagine... Uh, in your knowledge of Jonathan, that he'd be dishonoured himself. Mm -hmm. But he understands that because he, his view, it, we've heard him say this before, haven't we? Mm -hmm. He says David has been loyal, he's been consistent, mm -hmm. uh, he has never ever uh, disobeyed you, he's done astonishing things mm -hmm. for you of which you've benefited. He, he appeals to his father, this is, a, this is one loyal dude mm -hmm. who's a helpful warrior. We, we're in debt here. Well, it came about in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field for the appointment with David, and a little lad was with him. He said to his lad, Run, find now the arrows which I'm about to shoot. As the lad was running, he shot an arrow past him. When the lad reached the place of the arrow which Jonathan had shot, he called after the lad, Is not the arrow beyond you? Jonathan's lad picked up the arrow and came to his master. So the boy knows nothing. The lad was not aware of anything. Only Jonathan and David knew about the matter. Then Jonathan gave his weapons to his lad and said to him, Go, bring them to the city. When the lad was gone, David rose from the south side and fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times, and they kissed each other and wept together. But David more. What does our writer want us to know about that? <laughs> David more. Jonathan said to David, go in safety, inasmuch as we have sworn to each other in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord will be between me and you, and between my descendants and your descendants forever. Then he rose and departed, while Jonathan went into the city. And this is a very important time, because later, as you know, Saul and Jonathan meet a sticky end. Mm. And David is in deep grief for them both. But we need to understand now that David's now on his own. And he's got only one friend at court. And it's a close friend. It's a wholly reliable friend. But in fact, the friend can do nothing because he's the son. And so they need to split. But it's now clear to Jonathan and to David and to us, the readers, that David is on the run seriously now and has to now establish a whole new regime, which is what our map is about. David begins a series of wanderings, and in these wanderings, which are south of the Jerusalem area, into what we, and he will eventually set up uh, his own situation and power base at Hebron. And for seven years he'll rule there. But actually, in this early section, he's going to attract a whole lot of... Um, what would you say? Uh, people who are interested in not being found by this, the system. Uh, so that, but, but they're all warriors and they're all prepared to fight. In fact, they're mercenaries, fundamentally, who are now going to make their living fighting for David and David will make his living by protecting others. So David will run a protection, not so much a racket, but a protection service, but at the same time he will harass the enemies of Judah. And so he's got a double... A double edge here. He's actually fighting for his com uh, company already, for his land, people. He's taking that on, and they will get the message. But he's also protecting locals from the southern Philistines. So, what do you make of the statement, David wept more? 
it tells us that he himself is either the most, um, of the two men, he is the one more deeply moved, or uh, he is more deeply moved for himself. Mm. That, um, that he, I mean, it would stand to reason he really values Jonathan's friendship. I mean, Jonathan is extending to him an astonishing entree right. into the, into the, <laughs> into the royal court. Mm. And um, it would be a fairly difficult thing for a person, let's say like Abner, to actually put a wedge between David and Jonathan if he wished. Mm. That would be hard work. So there's a faction running here. But I don't think David's weeping because he's lost kudos or opportunity. I don't think he's, I don't read him to be that. I read him rather to be saying, I have a true friend here in the king's son. And astonishingly, we can't be together. And it's not going to go well here. And I'm, I am on my own here. This is serious thing. And if you read David's Psalms, you actually see that, don't you? You see that he is a very strongly aware that he is, he is looking only now to the Lord, who is my refuge and strength. And if God doesn't help me, well then, I'm, who will? I mean, I'm, I'm, now, I'm now on the outer at court. Um, my best friend is pretty hamstrung in what he can do. And he needs to turn up. He needs to be at court. That's Dad's court. And he can't afford... Jonathan can't afford not to be there. But David can't afford to be there for all sorts yeah. of so this is a very serious split and, and a deep a deep disturbance to them both. And now it turns out that David is now running alone, and this is where we begin to see this tonight. When David came to Nob uh, or Nov, you appreciate that Hebrew can read Nov or Nov, and, and notice that in your map he's come south from Ramah to Nov and he will move from Nov, which is number three on this map, across to the Philistine city of Gath, which is number four. When David came to Nov, to Ahimelech, the priest, and Ahimelech came trembling <laughs> to meet David, he said to him, Why are you alone and no one is with you? What is in Ahimelech's mind? <laughs> Remember, David's a serious commander. Uh, he's got clout and he has men with him, it turns out. But he's on his own. David says to Ahimelech the priest, the king has commissioned me with a matter and has said to me, let no one know anything about the matter on which I'm sending you and with, I have commissioned, and with which I've commissioned you and I have directed the young men to a certain place. So we presume... The young men are camped somewhere else and David has turned up personally in Ahimelech's area. And David actually is telling a flat lie. Uh, he has got a commission. Uh, but as far as Ahimelech is concerned, what, what can he do? The man's on a secret whatever and he's on secret king's business and the answer is and I've come alone because I've stationed my men somewhere else. Now, therefore, what do you have on hand? Can you give me five loaves of bread or whatever can be found? Meaning, I need to be fed. Uh, the priest answered David and said, There is no ordinary bread on the hand, but there's consecrated bread if only the young men have kept themselves from women. Now, this is the showbread, which is which is taken before the Lord each day and baked fresh. And so it'll be fresh bread. It won't be in any sense. Uh, it'll just be, the today, it'll be today's bread. But it's important that it's been handed on to something else. And so uh, you understand that this is not an easy place. To understand this, we look back at Leviticus 24, verses 5 and 9. Remember that Leviticus is really about the Levites, mm. about the priestly code. That's what it gets its name from, from the Septuagint, the Greek translation. And so here at verses 24, uh, 24, 5, excuse me, Leviticus 24, verses 5 and 9. The instruction is, You shall take fine flour and bake twelve cakes with it. Two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake, 
and you shall send them, set them in two rows, six to a row, on the pure gold table before the Lord. And you shall put fra pure frankincense on each row, that it may be a memorial portion for the bread, even an offering by fire to the Lord. Every Sabbath day you shall set it in order before the Lord, annually, and it's an everlasting covenant for the sons of Israel. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place. For it is most holy to him from the Lord's offerings by fire, his portion forever. Uh, so, I'm sorry, this happens every Sabbath. This is not every day. And what's important to notice is it's the priests do have a share in it. This is the whole idea of a fellowship offering. You're actually eating before the Lord. Where This is the whole understanding of the priestly code is they have access to God and they actually just eat stuff before the Lord. In this case, this bread. Exodus 25, 30 has a similar run. So can we presume that David has arrived on the Sabbath? Either that or the bread is there since last. So, um, so it might be seven days old. It wouldn't matter much because it's the sort of bread you and I would know as not like a damper so much, but pretty much a... Uh, a fairly dry bread. Mm. It, won't, it won't be a yeasty bread. There'll be no yeast in it at all. Mm. Ah. No. Um, I'm looking at Exodus 25, 30. Now this is the bread of the presence on the table before me at all times. You shall eat the bread of the presence. So this is a sign that we are eating because God is present and and the bread is a sign that God's table is open to his people. We appreciate Jesus will make much of this at the Lord's Supper, but not right now. The other place you need to be very sure about is in Mark chapter 2. <clears throat> you appreciate that there's a there's a very clear reference in the Gospels, Mark 2, and the parallel text, Luke 6, but Mark 2 would do. Remember the discussion at that time in Mark chapter 2 was... Uh, Sabbath again. Yes, the Sabbath again. I'm thinking, uh, yes, uh, Mark 2.23 and following. <coughs> Uh, the disciples are picking heads of grain and the Pharisees are saying that they're doing something not lawful on the Sabbath. And then Jesus says, have you never read what David did when he was in need and became hungry, he and his companions, how he entered the house of God in the time of <coughs> Abiathar, not Ahimelech? And this has caused great concern for scholars. Some of them think that actually Ahimelech is a person who is the second one who is under Abiathar. That's how they've reasoned it. But you'll notice the discrepancy. If it is one. Uh, but it's the time of Abiathar the high priest. So it may not be that Ahimelech is actually that. And they ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests. And he gave it also to those who were with him. Not just a matter of David himself, um, but the men he was with him. And his point was, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. In other words, the rest of God was designed as something God did. It's, as you would say, it's my Sabbaths, but it's my Sabbaths for you. And it's something which is going to give you a rest and, and, and ceasing from your labour as I did from mine. In this case, the bread is something which was consecrated to him. And Jesus' point is, David just understands something here. What does he understand? Uh, remembering that Jesus is, of, is bearing a similar issue, but the reverse. His people are eating on, and picking up grain as they walk through the fields. But uh, Jesus says, well, hang on, D David has established a precedent here, which is that the showbread, the bread of the presence, the facilities of God's communion with people, mm. these are for us. 
and that they are established for us, not, not in any sense uh, man for the Sabbath. He's saying the meaning of God's provisions for us are for us. And if David was in need, he is walking like a son. He is walking like a son in his father's house. And he understands that, that, that this can be done. Well, here's the occasion. Have the young men kept themselves from women? This is a view that military work is understood, that you wouldn't be having intercourse with your wife if you were a young man. Uh, you would be away on a mission. Military expeditions are a mission of God, and you don't mix that up with other things, and particularly you don't mix it up um, with uh, intercourse. Mm. David answered the priest and said, Surely women have been kept from us as previously when I set out. And the vessels of the young men, meaning their bodies, were holy. Though it was an ordinary journey, so David now has to um, weave and dodge to give an answer to Ahimelech. How much more than today will their vessels be holy? How much more than today? Previously, that was the case. How much more today? <laughs> what is he actually saying? He's saying, well, it's our normal practice to do this constantly, whenever we set out on a mission, but how much more today? His risk is high, <laughs> and he knows it. So the priest gave him... Where do you think his trust is running here? Can you see what he's doing? priest gave him consecrated bread, for there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, which was removed from before the Lord in order to put hot bread in its place when it was taken away. Now one of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. Meaning he was doing something of a vow or some matter. He was, he was doing something before the Lord. Uh, he had reason to be there. He's an Edomite. Mm. So that's a, a strange and unusual thing for starters. And he is there detained before the Lord. And his name was Doeg, the Edomite, the chief of Saul's shepherds. So he is looking after the king's flocks. David said to Ahimelech, Now is there not a spear or a sword on hand? For I brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's matter was urgent. Now, now we're beginning to see that David's actually uh, <laughs> only weaving and dodging. Uh, he knows it must look very strange mm. that he turns up as a top commander with no weapons in his hands, because mm. he's skipped and he's run away. <laughs> and, uh, and the men aren't there either, uh, to Himelech's mm. view. Uh, Jesus seems to imply they were there. And he's hungry. And he's hungry. So yeah. why did he choose Nob? A Nob is where, um, where the priests mm. are. He's yeah, going to the place where, choice. yeah, where the Lord's, the Lord's ministers are. Mm. He's going to a place where he's, he's looking for succor from God. Mm. Mm. Doesn't he know that they're going to cop it in the end, though? You figured that you'd still find out they're in trouble? You would wonder. Uh, well, yes, he would know that, but he wouldn't have known about Doeg the Edomite. Oh, but he did see, he said, I saw him there. He saw him there. And he wondered. He wondered. Well, these are men who are fundamentally also just simply saying, I'm doing what I can do and God is with me yeah. and I'll see what pulls off here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, these aren't... Uh, you don't want to necessarily think that everything is pre-thought in mm. some cunning mm. way. At the end of the day, David is a person who wanders, mm. like as in a wilderness, because that's the parallel, mm. and he's walking in a wilderness and he's, it's he and God and we're going together and mm. uh, I saw Doeg but didn't... Mm. And you would think, with Israel's history, that they wouldn't They wouldn't touch, touch the priests. priests. Mm. Mm. This was a very terrible... A very problem. serious affair. Mm. Mm. Well, he asks, is there a, a weapon or a sword? Mm. Uh, the priest actually said, well, the sword of Goliath, 
the Philistine whom you killed in the valley of Elah, it's wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. So that would be a witness or a testimony to God's favour to us that day and it would be kept in this, in this holy place. If you would take it for yourself, take it. For there's no other accepted here. David said, there's none like it. Give it to me. Now there's none like it, of course, because it's a Philistine piece of weaponry, so it'll be high quality. It'll be big. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, it will also, but he'll, he'll use it in a double-handed way, I suspect. Mm -hmm. Whereas perhaps Goliath used it with a single hand. Mm -hmm. But what's important is, it's also not only a good quality in make, but it's a sign of God's divine favour. What he's actually saying is, uh, it will remind me always that there was a day when I did things in the name of the Lord and it was extraordinarily effective. And so it, there's none like it. Give it to me. David arose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. Now, if you look at your map, uh, he's left Nob. He's not waiting to be around Gibeah. He's, he's heading right out, to the, out towards the, uh, the Mediterranean Sea and to Gath. And the servants of Achish, the king, said, Is this not David, king of the land? Uh, what do you understand by that expression? They, they must have heard something. They must have heard something. Or it's written later. Or they just think he's, a, he's, he's in the court. He's a serious deal. But they, they think of him as that. Did they not sing of this one as they danced? Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. They've certainly heard that. Um, David took these words to heart and greatly feared Achish, king of Gath. Meaning, if he thinks I'm a big deal in my own country, I better treat him very carefully indeed. For he may see me to be a major enemy. So he disguised his sanity before them and acted insanely in their hands. He scribbled on the doors of the gate, let his saliva run down his beard. Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see the man behaving as a madman. Why do you bring him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this one to me? And the madman in my presence, shall this one come into my house? So Achish says, I, I don't want him. Um, uh, he he's, he's lost it and he should go lose it somewhere else. So he actually... Um, he won't have him at this particular time. So David departed from there and uh, he escaped to the cave of Adullam, which you'll notice on your map is coming back towards the east and it's coming through a major valley. And when his brothers and all his father's household heard of it, they went down there to him. So the family meet in this cave. Everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered to him and he became captain over them. There were there about 400 men with him now. So he's now got a standing, uh, if not a standing army, we don't know how they're armed or whether they are at all or whether they're very poorly armed. Mm. They soon won't be because they'll start plundering and that's how you get arms. But you don't buy them. You steal you, you kill and strip the bodies. That's the, that's the name of the game. So, uh, so his family know where he is, um, um, and and all these malcontents who are in distress or debtors, people who owe money. Does he get his family? David get the family there because he figures Saul might go after them. Is that sort of mentality yeah. behind that as well? Yes, because the next text tells us that. That he went there. To, he went from there to Mizpah of Moab, which is across the Dead Sea. You'll notice, and he's taken there his mum and dad. Please let my father and my mother come and stay with you until I know what God will do for me. Now that's a very telling statement. What he's actually saying is, I'm I'm getting my mum and dad in a safe place. My brothers, they can look after themselves. Besides, they're serious players in Saul's army anyway, so that's not that's not a problem. But my mum and dad are old and. They need to be honoured and cared for. Uh, by the way, this man, the king of Moab, um, does take them in and David pays him, repays him that debt later on. 
but I want, you, I want them to come and stay with you until I know what God will do for me. Now, that's a giveaway. What he's actually telling us is, I, I think if God's anointed me, there's something going on. I can't understand what Saul is up to, but I know that I'm not safe, so I'll scram. And in going, I'll actually take these people with me and we'll form ourselves a place. When he left them with the king of Moab, they stayed with him all the time that David was in the stronghold, which is code for what you and I call Masada, which will more Masada. Masada. And uh, we'll come back to that. You'll notice the stronghold down there is on the uh, on the uh, east of the western the western shore of the Dead Sea. And the prophet Gad said to David, "Do not stay in the stronghold. Depart and go into the land of Judah." And so David departed and went in the, into the forest of Heresh. Heresh. Notice that David has got a prophet with him and Gad uh, serves him. He also eventually, of course, uh, gets hold of Abiathar because everybody else is killed. Mm. And Abiathar realises the only person I can go to now is David. I mean, he's the cause, or Saul is the cause, really, but David is the immediate cause of my demise and my family's death, mm. but I'm left alone. But at the moment, he has a prophet. Uh, he, he, he will be attended very soon by a priest and he himself will be a king. And we now have the three great movements of Jesus Christ in one setting, in three men. Saul heard that David and the men who were with him had been discovered. He heard that David and the men with him had been discovered. So they've someone spied them out. You appreciate Saul's got, got everybody out there, all the shepherds, every... I mean, he has no problem knowing what's going on in, in caves and places. And Saul was sitting in Gibeah under the tamarisk tree on the, height with his, on the height with his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing around him. And he said to his servants who stood around him, Hear now, you Benjaminites, will the son of Jesse also give, all to, you, uh, give to all, you, you, all of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commandments of thousands and commandments of hundreds? All of you have conspired against me so that there is no one who discloses to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. Hello, that's come out. And there's none of you who are sorry for me, uh, for me or disclose to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in ambush, as it is this day. Now that's his spin. His spin is to the local Benjaminites, you're a disloyal bunch and he's not going to give you anything. I don't know why you are like this, mm -hmm. but actually you have concealed from me this thing about my son and you've concealed to me the fact that he is now ambushing me, which of course is exactly the reverse. He's setting up to ambush mm -hmm. David. But, that's, but we the readers know that, to be fair. Saul doesn't know that. Then Doeg the Edomite, who was standing by, the servants of Saul said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Noph, to Ahimelech, the son of Ahituv. And he inquired of the Lord for him, gave him provisions, and gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. Now, you didn't know this, but Ahimelech actually must have inquired of the Lord for David. Mm. Or he inquired of the Lord about the bread. We're not sure which. What we should be sure is that in this case, Doeg says... And Doeg states this in a way that says, well, he is uh, abetting the enemy. He is providing arms. He is seeking God's will for him. I mean, he is doing stuff. The king sent someone to summon Ahimelech, the priest, and all his father's household. And the priests were at Nob, and they all came to the king. And Saul said, listen. And he answered, here I am, my lord. And Saul said, why have you and the son of Jesse conspired against me? In that you have given him bread and a sword and have inquired of God for him that he should rise up against me by lying in ambush as it is this day. So those three issues are seen to be in some way a support. We the readers know that when he first came to Ahimelech, he said, are you alone? <laughs> and we understand that Ahimelech is jammed, that he's... He fears the king. He can't go against David, who's saying he's on a secret mission. So how could he compromise that? So, so he's actually jammed. 
he, he has to do something. And he thinks in helping David, I'm helping Saul. He's on a secret mission. It's perfectly obvious. I've just helped the king. What the king is saying is, you've helped my enemy. Mm. Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who among all your servants is as faithful as David? Even the king's son-in-law, who is captain over your garden, is honoured in your house. Did I just begin to inquire of God for him today? Far be it from me. Do not let the king impute anything to his servant or to any of the household of my father. For your servant knows nothing at all of this whole affair. Meaning himself. The king said, You shall surely die, Himelech, you and all your father's household. That, of course, is a command. Now what you have to understand is, what Ahimelech is saying is, why shouldn't I inquire for David? He's your servant. <laughs> and he's a seriously, seriously um, senior captain. What, what are we about here? Um, and why would the king impute anything to his servant? That I take it he means himself or my f father's household. For I don't know anything about this whole affair. All I did was I cared for him and he's your servant. That's perfectly sensible of me to do. So Himelech holds to a line and his line is, I have served my king as far as I knew to do and I've done things that if you accuse me of doing these things for David of course I have and why wouldn't I? You know, He doesn't deny, he simply says, it's, it's in your interests but the king says you'll die. The king said to the guards who are attending him, turn around and put the priests of the Lord to death because their hand also is with David and because they knew that he was fleeing and did not reveal it to me. Well, they didn't know. That's the point. But the servants of the king were not willing to put forth their hands to attack the priests of the Lord. They've got some sense. The king said to Doeg, who is an Edomite, you turn around and attack the priests. And he turned around and attacked the priests. He killed 85 men that day who wore the linen ephod. So this is a very serious affair now. Well, you can see that we are now developing into something. Saul is now making serious errors. Mm. He struck off the city of priests with the edge of the sword, men and women, children and infants, donk oxies, donkeys and sheep, and he struck the edge of the sword. So in other words, he, he wiped out their whole place. Mm. But one son of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. David said to Abiathar, I knew on that day when Doeg the Edomite was there, he would surely tell. I have brought about the death of every person in your father's household. Which of course is true but not true. He is the immediate cause but he's not the distal cause. He is, he, he is, in, he is in a sense um, caught up with Saul. And he therefore says, stay with me. Do not be afraid. He who seeks my life seeks your life. You're safe with me. And so this is how David now begins to have this relationship. And uh, Abiathar serves him very well as a priest. And he often finds the word of the Lord for him constantly. But tonight we're opening up an important section here. Because what we've seen is that Saul, who is now, as we've already discussed, you know, with much more detail as we did last time, how an evil spirit from God is now set free to move upon a man who already has opened himself really to that spirit mm. by virtue of the fact that he's gone against God. But what we've also noticed is that Jonathan and David have got um, not, not a pact, they, they, they've got a covenant and Jonathan has initiated that. So it must be true that what God has actually done with the son of Saul is that he has awakened him to the significance of David. Or he's done it simply by showing him that David is a true man and a good man and a man who is faithful to God. Uh, he's not above telling lies and he can uh, weave and dodge mm. and he, but, but you and I mustn't think that at all. Mm -hmm. uh, our issue is not in any sense to understand um, or to sit in judgment on David about that for, the, for this reason. That the, the issues of faith are faith in the context in which you find yourself. 
And, and you could have argued, as David might have done, that he was protecting Ahimelech by telling him he was on secret king's business mm. and if he was going to help him, he'd be helping Saul. Mm. And he might have seen what he did say. He saw Doeg the Edomite, but he spoke out loud something which, if Doeg had have been more honest, he would have said, what he said about what he was doing was this. And that's why this guy's fed him. And, O oh, king, you shouldn't be too upset about that. He was tricked. All Abiathar says is, I don't know anything about this issue. So, so these honourable men actually stay honest, but in actual fact, what happens is the situation is so messy that actually we're in a place. So we don't know why David lies, except to, I, I don't think he lies in order to get him elect to give him the bread but in order to protect him as he will take the bread. <laughs> so we have to see there's something here that's running quite deeply. We're also are noticing that our writer is now bringing to a climax, a fairly sh sure climax, that David is now out of the court. He is no longer in a place which is safe, uh, which was not unsafe, and he has had to flee for his safety. So we've now got the understanding of our writer which is saying Saul is now taking an issue with the anointed of the Lord himself. So here's this amazing situation that the anointed, the first anointed is going to take out his own movement on the second anointed. The second anointed won't touch the anointed because that's his whole point. He understands that's crazy. And so Saul is doing the crazy thing and what we're understanding is that Saul is making serious blunders and errors and his errors escalate and they just keep escalating. In fact, our writer will show again and again, David has him on the edge but never, never closes. <coughs> David has Saul's life in a couple of places and, and, and never bothers. Well, he doesn't bother. He will not touch him. But he will do it to show him, don't you see, I'm not your enemy? Uh, but Saul is not going to see that. So that takes us to 1 Samuel 22, uh, 23. And, uh, and the, the, his next step will be to move into Keilah. But we'll just take a break here. Now bear in mind we're now looking at a much broader theme. Our broader theme is that the elect man has now become the rejected man. The new elect man is now interfacing with the rejected man and this election and rejection is seen as a whole that, so that we're going to see that Saul and David are a unit uh, because it's in their generation that you will see this double sense of elect and rejected which is what Paul will develop in Romans 9 to 11 but also will be the way in which you would see it these doubles are all the way through and so just as we've seen with uh, the patriarchs with Isaac and Jacob, with Ishmael and Ishmael and Ishmael and whoever it was. Isaac, wasn't it? Jacob and Esau. Sorry. Once, when you see these doubles running all the way through, this is another example of it, and we're going to see this is quite important because it's in this context of both that you see that. The responsibility of men for their own actions is clear. The overall sovereignty of God in the double is clear. Our writer is making that crystal clear for us. And that the, and that the reality of evil is also being introduced into this mm -hmm. statement. But an evil which is in God's command. It's, the sovereignty of God is never lost. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and even if Saul will do dreadful things... Mm -hmm and wipe out a town, then he will. Uh, but someone will escape and he will carry through and go on. There will always be something here. Now, Heavenly Father, we do thank you this day that you are a God of great kindness and a God who also allows men a long, long reign. And you give them a leash where at the end, you will bring them to a sticky end. If Saul will carry on, he will. And you will do that. And yet, on the way, 
David is being not so much groomed, but is in a place of enormous difficulty and needs to rely upon you like he did as a little boy watching over sheep. And the thing he seems to understand so well is that God is his strength and that he is the person who will look after me. And we thank you for his words to the king of Moab to look after his mother and father until he sees what God will do for me. Lord, if you don't do it for David, if you are not for him, he cannot be the king and he cannot be the governor of your people and the shepherd of them. We want to praise you that you stood by him in difficult places. We give you thanks tonight for Jesus, who is the elect man and the rejected man, both at once, for our sakes, and how you looked after him. And his faith was tested enormously. And we just want to praise you today for such a saviour. And we thank you in his name. Amen. <laughs>